the owner of this Land Rover came to see me about two weeks, two and a half weeks ago. Said his Land Rover wasn't starting. Been in the garage for donkey's years. It was all covered in dust and stuff like that, but the rain's washed it off, which is a good thing. So, it came on a tow truck. And the guy said he didn't have a key. The, guy, the owner couldn't find the key, he was looking for the key. Well, after, after over two weeks, I, I guess he can't find it because I need to move this uh, pretty sharpish and find out what's wrong with it. So anyway, here's a little story for you. A blank key from Britpart, you know, our favourite part supplier, not really, was £10. £10 for a blank key. Brand new Lucas lock with key, I think it was about 46 quid. So let's have a look and see what it's like. It doesn't say where it was made, and this was only £10 more than a aftermarket Britpart one. Now, I did buy from Britpart this time for, for this job, because I had some other bits and pieces that uh, I needed to get, that Bermac didn't sell. There we are. Again, no markings on it whatsoever. I bet you that this is exactly the same as a, a Chinese one. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me that Lucas are making them in China because even the box doesn't mention where they're made. Well, I don't care really, as long as it works. And, and a sort of a Perhaps the clue is the keys look exactly the same. I don't know. But it works, that's the, that's the main thing. It, you know, you put your key in and it works. But the reason is that, like I said, for £10 for a key, I could take this old lock down to the locksmith and get a blank key made to fit that lock. All right, but it's gonna cost me more than the lock. All right, there's a bit of shipping in it. But at least I can guarantee for the next few years that this is gonna be working quite reliably. The reason is, the last thing you want is the steering lock to come on when you're driving. That's why I never take them apart and I never fix them. I just either replace the uh, the switch at the back, but other than that, I will not touch steering locks. I'd rather not have one. So again, the other things that go with it are some, uh, what do they call them? Like the shear bolts, that's right. These shear bolts, let's have a, let's have a look. Let's put packets with like little zip ties on. These things here. Now these are designed to when they reach a specified torque to snap the head off. It's like a security bolt. Good idea mate. What a great idea. But they're a bugger to get off. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and change this lock. And I'll show you all the bits and pieces you, can take, you need to take off. But it's not as easy as you think. I just had to wait a couple of hours so uh, the sun would come round so shining this way because naturally this is a bit difficult to move. When we take off the steering lock we've got to take quite a few bits off, a lot more than you think. We've got to take off this cap, we've got to take the steering wheel off which involves us taking using our puller which I've shown you before but briefly there's a screw at the bottom. Now the steering lock's jammed on that thing, so let's get this off. There we go. There's a screw at the bottom. Screw at the bottom there, take that off. We undo the nut and then we put our puller on. Of course I forgot the spider, right. haven't I? Take the nut off. Now there is the proper washer. We're quite fortunate on this car because it is kind of unique. But it's hardly been touched. It's a very early two and a quarter petrol from France. And um, as you can see when people haven't been buggering about with them 
All the dashes are quite nice and it's got 126,000 kilometres on it. It's not too bad. <clears throat> so we're going to put our puller on. <clears throat> all, the, all the puller is is just a little flat plate. It's not special. You don't need any claws or anything like that. But you must use a puller to take these off. You can't, you can't hammer them off. And you'll just do a little bit at a time. <laughs> that was it. That was really easy, eh? So, with that out of the way, now we're going to take our columns uh, off here. We're going to, there's four bolts and one at the bottom. It's four into the plastic. Now these have a notorious problem of stripping out when people have put them back in again because there's only a little insert in here. Now the later cars they put longer plastic supports in here so there was just little self-tapping screws in. A great idea. But I'll show you, when I get this off I'll show you what the problem is. The problem is in here there is a little brass insert the problem is when it's sort of been pushed in, well the problem when you tighten up the, the screw it pulls it out and then you think oh well I'm not going to put it back in again anymore and that's it, it's screwed. Now, lots of people have asked me, so why, why do we have why do we have this bit, what, what's this bit for down here, see this, see when they put the cowlings back together what have we got that for? It's for the choke on the petrols. See, there it is. There you go, it's for the choke. And that's why it's quite important to put this bolt in the bottom. Now, it's supposed to be moulded into here as the choke, but it's obviously falling off. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> now we can take off this uh, instrument uh, cluster. Four screws, one, two, three four pull it out and then we're going to disconnect as much as we can to get into it because we need as much space to get in there there isn't much space to play around let's get that off I've unplugged the uh, instruments we just don't unplug them that's quite easy to do there was one broken tab on there which was a bit of a disappointment but never mind now <clears throat> the reason why we're taking all that lot off is that we need to sort of get access to the uh, wires at the back of here but also we need to get to this clamp here these bolts now fortunately somebody's had this off before because it must be my lucky day they've still got the bolt heads on here they haven't sheared anything off so somebody's had this lock off before now you probably can't see but there's supposed to be a washer between these two pieces I'm not sure if it's at the other side, but this is really going to speed this job up. After wiggling the switch out, or the lock, we can uh, get access to the wires at the back, and somebody's already put a, an extra wire in here. But what I want you to pay attention to is the position of the wires, because a lot of people get stuck with this. So the wiring, I've put this exactly the same. This is pin 1. Pin 1 goes is for the red a white with a red tracer goes to your starter. Pin 2 has got the double uh, connector on and that's for your power from your battery. Pin 3 has got the the uh, white wire on. This is an accessory, somebody's put this on later. But it's pin, pin uh, 3 is the white wire and pin 4, the one that's got bent, is this one here. Now this is a brown with an orange tracer but on later cars it was uh, white with an orange tracer and that's for your accessories so if you want to listen to your radio or something groovy uh, that's the way to do it so this pin's got damaged in uh, shipping I'm going to straighten this out swap them over and then we'll uh, have a look at this switch and compare can you remember in the introduction when we looked at that Lucas switch and I actually opened the box there was no markings on it at all was there, remember that? That's why I think it's a Chinese one. Because this is 
a genuine Lucas switch. How can we tell? It's got Lucas written in there and it's also got 57SA and that's the type of switch on here. Also, date stamp 1102, told you it being changed before. So, yeah, they look identical but that's usually that's usually a bit of a giveaway is that switch. That switch there, no markings on it at all. My point is, if it was a genuine Lucas switch, why change the moulding? Why, why, why do away with your uh, logo or your writing or something like that? doesn't make any sense. Whereas the Chinese one would be. So re refitting this is quite, the re like they say in the Haynes manual, is the opposite of, uh, well, re re removal. But I'm just going to guide that in and I'm going to be paying particular attention to that white wire with the extra jumper on the back because uh, it might get knocked off. <laughs> Rather like these switches really. With the switch now fitted, will it start? No. The battery is so flat it's got nothing in it at all. Um, the problem with the battery is, I'll, I'll get it out and I'll show you. Um, it's been left all the time with the battery in. Through several winters, even in a, a garage that hasn't got snow, you know, your car's not covered in snow, it's still when it's minus 30 and these batteries have got no charging, you might as well throw them out because uh, the plates have buckled and that's it, they're finished. So, let's change the battery. A sure sign that a battery's frozen is the sides have bulged. Especially the ends. They've bulged out. Um, pity really, because it doesn't look a very old battery. But it's obviously come from France, because it's all mostly in French. Yeah. Scrap. Let's put a proper battery on. Uh, I'm not sure if this is going to work. I just want to, uh, the battery clamp on the ground is snapped. Um, might not work. But one thing I wanted to say to you is that um, the battery terminals on these old Land Rovers are actually quarter width worth. That's why you can't get a 13 mil or a half inch on. That's that was the size. Um, right. Battery's on. Gear. A chalk. Well, it turns. I think these had an electric fuel pump, didn't they? I hear nothing. Let's investigate. As I mentioned before, this car's in remarkably good condition because it hasn't been buggered about with. Um, it is a two and a quarter because the later ones were two and a half. They came out in the perhaps the last of the defenders, but I think this is well last of the petrol defenders. Um, this one's a two and a quarter. All the pipework and all the wiring is really nice. Interesting note is that these are the two fuel pipes. One's a feed and one's a return. And this little device up here is a weir. So fuel's pumped up into there, and when that fills up, the overflow goes back into the tank. And at the bottom of that weir, it goes into the carburabra, whatever it's called. Now, I'm going to grab a screwdriver and take off this pipe off here to see if we've got any fuel, rather than crawling around underneath to see if there's any petrol in so it. So I've opened the window and I can put my hand inside and turn the key and not find it. I can hear a relay clicking. There's no fuel coming out of there. It has got an electric pump on, hasn't it? Yep. So, the next thing we've got to look at, where's the pump? And has it got power to the pump? These early Defender 90s had the fuel pump in the tank. So the first thing we're going to do is set our voltmeter to volts and see if we've got any 
power on this plug here. Now one's positive and one's negative. Nothing. Not a sausage. So the next thing we're going to do is set this to ohms and see if we've got a ground. Which is the ground? This one. We have a ground. So that means we've got no power to this uh, pump. Hmm. So what we've got to do now is find out why we've got no power, naturally. Uh, could there be a break in the wire or could it be a fuse? We don't know. Let's have a look. Well, with a bit of rubbing around and things like this, it's just decided to work again. Um, but we've got no... we can't hear a pump pumping. However, fortunately, I think we've got a pump. We've got a pump. Let's plug this in and see if it works. Mm, not that one, this one. Hey, listen. So that means a pump shot. Now, um, I wonder if this is for a 90. Well, we're soon going to find out, aren't we? You've got to see this. I haven't just taken it out. I'm just about to take it out. Only on this channel do you see live problems. I think there's been moisture in the tank. And that's probably why that doesn't work. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take the drain bung out of the tank and I'm going to pop the steam cleaner in there and steam it out before we do anything else because that is disgusting or as the same French diggerless and the petrol in it bleh, doesn't even smell of petrol like cat pee right back when we've got this tank washed out I have out. no idea how much fuel's in this but what I've done is I've lifted it up and put it on my stands and it's got the forklift at the front so the front's in the air and the drain plug is right at the back so let's get a bucket underneath. It's a 19 mil key. Let's have a look. Might not be any in it. It could be full. Didn't look full. Oh, look at the colour of that. even smell of petrol. It's been in there for years. You know we've got to clean everything out now. I'm sure the carb will be full of crap and the filter. And... Terrible. Tell you something though, keep your parts washer going for a bit. That's what I do with this old petrol, I just chuck it in the parts washer. Looks like I'm going to have to find a container because my bucket's nearly full. Yep. Oop, what is it? It is wet. <laughs> Dead petrol in your sleeves. Oh, is this still running? Hmm. Ah, there's some filth in there. I've never seen petrol that colour before. You know, if you're going to leave a car a long time, it's a good idea just to drain the drain all the fuel off out the tank. And then just fill it with fresh stuff instead of leaving it. Petrol here in Canada isn't all that good, you know. It's, um, 
it's low octane and if you sort of leave it for a while well it hasn't got no poop like for example with a lawnmower if you leave it in your lawnmower for a year you won't start oh look at that that's water look Hmm. I think that's most of it out. Hmm. Boy, there's some crud in that tank. Gonna have to get the steam cleaner out. First of all, I've got to find somewhere to put this petrol. I hope you can see this on this screen. I've got my uh, boroscope out there. That's the bottom of the tank. There's the drain bung, look. Can you see it? Still got a bit of water in there, look. But this tank is so rusty inside. Look at the state of that. It did take quite a bit of uh, getting out. What's that thing there? The one thing about these cameras, you just don't know really what you're looking at. But of course, camera on a camera isn't always the best. But um, what I wanted to show you is something else. Just let me stop this a minute. Now, this is interesting. This is a, one of the best pictures ever. This is actually, if you can see, yeah. See if I can get a picture of that. See that? That is the top of the tank. That's this bit here we're looking at right now. This We're looking at this bit here. Just here. Because I've turned the camera into a, like a U-bend. And the rust underneath. There, there you can see the camera there look. Oh no, so I tell the light it's about here. But look at the rust. I'm sorry it's not particularly good pictures but... Oh, there's the sender look. Can I get the picture of that? Mm, maybe. Yeah, there's the sender unit look. Well, look at the rust in that tank. It's tricky trying to do two things at once. But no, they, I think we've got a good... I mean, it's not leaking yet, but... All that is going to contaminate your fuel. And I washed it out, I rinsed it out, but man, the rust just doesn't seem to want to stop. So, oh and another thing, where's the, oh yeah, let's have a look over here. I've got to, I've got to power wash up my garage as well, for tomorrow's job. This is the only uh, fuel pump I've got. This was sent by uh, Alan from Brit uh, from Bearmark. Um, and it's not quite the right one but I could get it to fit see it's got a bracket on here if I could get them screws out of there and change that pipe I bet you I could get that to fit but then again I don't know how much money this guy wants to put into this I would put a tank on I wouldn't even bother with this, I'd just put a tank on. Well, not unless he wants to sell it cheap. Mm -mm. Anyway, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to sign off from now because it's a really messy, ugly job. And I'm going to park it back up again. And I'm going to leave the top of the tank off. And leave the drain bung out so it can dry out. If push comes to shove, we can put some petrol in it. But I need to find out where the, where the fuel filler is, uh, filter is. Hmm. Let, me, let me put this back. And then we'll uh, we'll see where the filter is. I can't really get my camera underneath much more, but I put a drain bung under it. A drain plug, a drain connector. Let's see if what this is like. This might not be too bad. I still needs changing.
This is a bit better colour petrol. And the reason for that is it's it, this hasn't had much of a surface area to condensate in. Um, can you see that in there? See when I pour it in here? No rust. No rust at all. So, uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to put that back on. I'm going to put this back on temporarily. Wait a minute, where have you <laughs> keep going all over the place? I'm going to put this back on temporarily with a. Because I haven't got any of these filters. I did have one spot attack, I had about 50 of them. Give them all away. Um, put this back on. And then we'll try and trace the owner because I don't even know where he lives. <laughs> yeah, these are a bit tricky to do. Right. Like I say, when you get the when we get a new filter, it will come with all the rubbers and things like that that we need all the new seals. So I'm just going to put that on temporarily and see what he says. So I think we'll call this end of part one. See you later.